Welcome to PlatformCon 2023. My name is Nikki Watt, and I'm the CEO and CTO of a hands-on software development consultancy called OpenCredo, based in London. And I'm going to be speaking to you about why is it so hard to create great platforms as a product. Now, I gave a talk at PlatformCon 2022, where we had a look at, given our experience as a consultancy, working with a variety of customers, what does it take to actually build or set up a great platform initiative? Had a look at lessons learned and things like that. So that talk has some background uh, to this talk that I'm giving now. So I put the link here in case it's helpful to you. But whether it's that talk or other talks that give advice on the subject, it seems that many organizations still struggle to actually do this well. And this got me thinking, why is this the case? Is there something that seems to stand out more as specifically challenging or something that is harder to do than really kind of meets the eye? And that is where this talk was really kind of born. So the clue is in the title. Why is it so hard to create a great platform as a product? So inherently in the title, I give away my very firm belief that great platforms are forged in the fires of a platform as a product or product thinking mindset. But it seems to be that it's this as a product bit when it has to get applied to platforms that there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect. And I observe that whilst on paper and theoretically it seems simple enough for uh, people to follow, on the ground this is much harder to actually do in practice. And so we're going to dig into that and explore why that is the case. But first, uh, we probably need to have a look at why do I think the platform as a product concept is um, important. Now, many people have done specific talks on this topic um, and gone really uh, deeply into it. And I do recommend that you check out some of their talks as part of PlatformCon. But by way of a short introduction, product thinking is really core to building a great product, whether this is a platform or otherwise. And this is because it prevents us from building something that nobody wants. The whole point of product thinking is to make sure that we put our users and their experiences front and center of what we do so we don't just deliver a nice collection of disjoint features, but something that uh, really produces their outcome and that is useful to them. So applying this to platforms, and particularly to internal developer platforms, is what, which is what I'm really speaking about here, is no different. So firstly, this helps us to focus on the problem space of the users. And from our perspective, that is more predominantly your internal uh, developers. And this is about doing what is needed in order to make life easier for them, in order for them to deliver software to their end users. Now, as with any other product, a platform needs to be useful and desirable. So as I said, not a ragtag collection of stuff, but rather a curated set of offerings and features that users will genuinely find useful and actually want to use to do their job. Now, this is where product thinking provides us with techniques and the approaches and the frameworks that really help us to engage our users, get feedback, and adapt the product uh, and the platform in order to make it fit for purpose. Finally, with many products, uh, you need to consider how do you actually deal with adding new features and options to your platform? So how do you deal with the upgrades and the downgrade paths? Core ideas in any product that need to be thought about and designed in right from the start to ensure that you can proactively create a platform that can provide a sustainable service to your business. So in short, we really are relying quite heavily on some of the product thinking sort of tools and techniques to actually, actually help us create a really good fit for purpose platform. So product thinking to the rescue, but we seem to have these uh, stumbling blocks in our way. So let's have a look at why that may be the case. So the first stumbling block uh, that can occur um, that I see is because we don't always afford the platform the same considerations that we might uh, if this was an external product. So we know it's all about the users and their needs. But because our users are internal, we sometimes have a tendency to think that we have a bit of inside track into what they're actually thinking, what they want. And maybe we can just short circuit some of the sort of uh, user inter interaction stuff and just get there a little bit quicker. Now, taking internal consumers for granted is not necessarily something that is done intentionally, but assumptions are made about them. And this includes things like their level of ability. So you might say, well, they're developers. I'm a developer. They should know how to configure a YAML file. So I'm sure it's OK if we just provide that as an interface uh, for, the, for the system. You might also think that you know what's best for them in terms of best practice for CI/CD, and then impose that uh, on them as the way to do things. 
Also, they are a very captive audience. They can't really go anywhere. And so there's an assumption on their willingness to just accept whatever is put in front of them because, as I said, they, they, can't, really, um, they can't really say no sometimes. And this can happen in the case where maybe features are not quite ready yet, but they're pushed out anyway because, well, they're just internal users and it's not really going to make that much of a difference. Uh, we, they can always help us to, you know, sort of uh, make it better. Now, you generally wouldn't or you shouldn't uh, make such assumptions about external users when employing product thinking. Rather, you would expressly ask them and conduct surveys to find out what is required in order to tailor the interface and the approach to what they actually need. Now, in addition to this, uh, because most platform teams don't actually ship an actual product to the end users, they are sometimes treated as a cost center. And this treating, treating the, the platform as a cost center or the product as a, as a cost center can actually cause problems uh, if it's not recognized. So this can manifest where the the initiative is run more like a project where it's focused on delivering like very specific features on time and to a budget, but not really what we're looking for here is more of the product thinking where we have roadmaps and we have ways of interacting with users and getting feedback and having this, this whole kind of loop. Now, this can run the risk of having budgets and sort of cost cutting measures uh, sometimes apply to you because you're not shipping a real product or it's not perceived to be a real product. So it's seen as an easier target for cuts. Now, an example of this might be where um, if you were an external team, you might say, well, it's uh, feasible enough for us to have a marketing team or a support team that is really kind of out there and helping users to onboard onto our product and uh, use it properly. But if you then ask for something like a dedicated evangelist um, sort of role or these type of positions, you might find that they're deprioritized as sort of surplus requirements because, well, it's uh, not necessarily seen as um, it's not a proper product. So the antidote to this, however, is um, if you are trying to do this and to try and change the perception of leadership, if you are in this, this particular bind, is to try and market the value of the platform as either a revenue or a faster to market enabler. And this can be done by suggesting the use of metrics. So, for example, if you might suggest that let's have a look, how fast does it take for a, a new team to onboard uh, a new product and get it to market without the platform and with the platform? This can be used to actually drive and provide evidence for the fact that actually the, the platform really does provide end um, uh, usage to, to, to the end users and to the business. Now, the second stumbling block uh, can come across because we often insist on making our platforms mandatory. So if you look at other successful products out there, no one forces you to buy an Apple phone or to use AWS services. You generally do so because you've decided it's worth it. Now, product thinking understands this and gears the techniques and the approaches to try and build in specific opportunities to solicit regular feedback from users to actually improve, adapt, and make it an, a more attractive proposition as you kind of go along. And this needs to happen with the platform as well. The problem is that if you make the platform mandatory, you actually close off some of these feedback loops. Whilst an optional approach invites more discussion and innovation because it actually gets you much closer to something that is built for fit for purpose. So if feedback is not provided, well, feedback is often not provided because people will think, well, if it's mandatory, why would I, you know, I might, I might not sort of bother giving feedback because it doesn't matter anyway, it's not critical, and they're not necessarily going to do something about it because they've decided how they're going to do it in any case. So optional is really the way to go. But why does it happen that we, we try to make the, the platform mandatory? Sometimes I would say this mandatoriness comes because there's a pressure to actually use the platform for purely regulatory or um, security compliance. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not at all saying that this is not a, it can't be a feature of the platform or that it can't be used to achieve this. But when it becomes the driving force uh, behind things, then the focus shifts off of what the user needs and more onto how can we get them to actually comply with the, the least amount of fuss? But again, if this is actually one of your goals, what you might want to do is not opting for a command and control type approach, but rather give the teams a choice. 
So define and communicate clearly what is required of either the security or the compliance um, aspects and allow the teams to do that themselves. But then give them the option of saying the platform can do it for you and actually it will go X times faster or it will be so much easier and use a carrot rather than a stick in order to entice them onto the platform rather than force them uh, because it's mandatory. Now, similarly, a platform is also sometimes viewed purely as a cost saving exercise. And this may well be true, but again, this is something that is more of a benefit maybe for the organization and not so much for the end user in this case. If it's a driving force, the focus is gonna shift off of the users, what they need, what they, what, what, what they kind of need for the platform to do for them. And it becomes more about how can we do this as quickly and as cheaply as possible. So with mandatory platforms, you will find that your teams may still land up actually being successful, but it may be in spite of the platform rather than because of it. And you really want to change its reputation you don't want. So shifting more to have a, um, an optional platform is the way to go in this case. Now, product thinking is all about focusing on the, on the user, but also on the problem first and not the solution. And this is so that you can build the right thing. But many times our focus is often drawn to the solution in the first place and specifically that there is one right solution that we need to build on one right platform rather than recognizing that this could just as easily be a collection of various curated things brought together. So why are we sort of constantly drawn to this one mono platform to kind of rule them all outcome? So one of the assumptions that uh, we see here is that um, there's an assumption that's made that the platform needs to support every single use case out there. So you may be on a digital transformation and you have a big legacy estate that you need to uh, sort of port over, but this doesn't mean that every single application from that legacy estate needs to land and be uh, catered for on your platform. Some may be deemed, that, you know, they just need retirement, some may be lifts and shifts, and these probably couldn't and shouldn't land in a cloud native platform if it's not suitable. But the assumption that you must cater for everybody uh, runs the risk that your main, uh, the main platform that you're building just becomes diluted and it becomes not fit for anyone in the end. And you just land up with a, a sort of a jack of all trades and a master of none type platform. Now, the other area where assumptions are made is around um, the offerings that are actually implemented in the platform. So if, for example, you're offering a CI CD platform or a CI CD feature, it may be that you, you think, well, there, there should be only one of these things. We've only got enough resources to actually build one, and there shall be only one. But there's going to be different um, teams with different requirements, some writing a lot of control, some maybe just wanting to give one or two sort of parameters and, and get a, a pipeline going. And it's okay to have multiple different implementations for the same feature. It is not problematic. You obviously don't want a plethora of them, but this assumption that there must be only one implementation is something that can actually cause you to, to create um, features that are not fit for purpose. So moving out of this sort of mono platform um, thinking is a stumbling block that uh, is well worth uh, trying to avoid. Fourthly, uh, some of the challenges can occur because of how we actually put our teams together to tackle building the right product. And sometimes our blind spots and our assumptions can cause us to create less than ideal setups, team setups. Now, in many companies, platform teams start out by being staffed with predominantly infrastructure engineers. And this is a very natural um, uh, sort of uh, play because the platform is seen as more OPSI in nature. You're building infrastructure services. However, we observe that this natural skew towards the OPSI centric um, sort of solutions lands up um, so op-centric um, staffing lands up with more op-centric solutions. And instead, what we really want is this balance of both infrastructure as well as application. And this means ideally we want to have a, a bilingual team for lack of a, a better phrase, and a mix of engineers that really understand architecture and application requirements, some of the challenges around that, as well as infrastructure in order to help really kind of bridge the gap. Now, in a platform team, this point is particularly uh, maybe a little bit controversial, but the product owner or the product management type role is really key. And 
I would say that ideally you want somebody who has got a technical background here. So this is not essential, but it is certainly helpful because being forearmed with some of this knowledge can really help to build more sort of natural empathy and understanding with, with the various different users of the platform in different situations. It can be useful when they may need, you may need to be sort of a referee in terms of different requirements coming in, competing requirements, or indeed actually to help sort of understand and assess when to make trade-offs about what things should be in platforms and not. Obviously, you would be working with your technical um, architects in this, in this particular case and your platform engineers, but having this technical background, I, I would say, is quite uh, important if you can if you can if you can find a product owner that has that because it really does make a, a big difference in, in smoothing the, the the sort of some of the the road to understanding some of the, the challenges that your end users have now another less than ideal setup is to have a static or non-evolvable team and this is specifically with a platform team in whatever shape or form you kind of find it is not able to spare the time or the resources to help teams onboard and troubleshoot so this time needs to explicitly be built in and factored into. Now we find the concept of using enablement teams as it's described in team topologies as a really helpful uh, mechanism here. So this will allow your platform team to really engage with the users and build in solid feedback loops. So we've had uh, quite a few um, sort of engagements where these enablement teams are really able to understand and work with the, the end um, uh, developers and, and, and engineers to find out what is it that is problematic that we need to feed back into the platform and go on this kind of loop where you have a, a decent sort of feedback. So the team themselves make progress, but also that, that knowledge comes back into the, the platform and, and you get this, this good sort of loop going. Finally, uh, the fifth uh, stumbling block is one of my main points actually from my previous talk. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but really as engineers, we tend to have a very unhealthy focus on technology. We always wanna start by building something concrete and uh, this can really lead to problems and you can trip over yourself if that's the case. Key to building the right thing is to focus on your users first and the technology last. So don't let the tail wag the dog. Think of your users first, do the tech last. And if you want more on this, I suggest um, that you have a look at my previous talk. So in conclusion, um, just to reiterate, I think great platforms are indeed forged in the fires of uh, platform as a product or product thinking mindset. But you need to be aware that there are some potential stumbling blocks on this path. And this can happen because there are either parts of you where your organization's approach and ways of working, which may seem very natural and default to you, but some of these assumptions may ultimately work against you uh, in achieving what, in trying to achieve the end outcome if you aren't aware of them. So I list them here in one slide for your convenience. Uh, but with that, I have come to the end of my talk. And so I just wanna say thank you very much for the opportunity. And I look forward to um, taking some questions in the forum after this. Thank you.